Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this contemporary military forum titled Bringing the OIB to the Tactical Edge. I'm Major General Linda Singh, retired, as you can imagine, former TAG of Maryland. And I am so pleased to be able to introduce this panel today. As your professional association, the Association of the United States Army is proud to provide forums like this one throughout the year that broaden the knowledge of the knowledge base on Army professionals and those who support our Army. AUSA, AUSA amplifies the U.S. Army's narrative to the audiences inside the Army and help us to further the association's mission to be the voice for the Army's support for the soldier. Of course, we cannot do this alone. AUSA relies on its members to help us tell the Army's story and to support our soldiers and their families. A strong membership base is vitally important for our advocacy in Congress, the Pentagon, and the defense industrial base, as well as to the public in the communities across the country through AUSA's 122 chapters within the United States and nine other countries. Who, who here is a member of AUSA? So can you please raise your hand? Thank you. For everyone else, unless you opted out when you registered, you are now a new basic no-cost member of AUSA, and we thank you for that. And if you're not already a premium member and would like to elevate your membership benefits, please visit the AUSA member zone located at L Street Bridge near Halls D&E, or sign up online at ausa.org slash memberships. AUSA is a membership organization. We can't do it without you. Your help, you help AUSA be an effective voice for the total army and provide support for the soldiers and their families. On behalf of General Brown, AUSA's president and CEO and the rest of the AUSA, the, the speakers have been given a small token, very small, of uh, appreciation for their time. So hopefully you all have gotten that. And we appreciate you being here today with us. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Lieutenant General Chris Mohan, the Deputy Commanding General and Acting Commander of the U.S. Army Materiel Command. As the Acting Commander, Lieutenant General Mohan uh, manages a $300 billion portfolio and leads the worldwide workforce of 162,000 soldiers, small city, civilians and contractors who can generate project and sustain our Army's combat power whenever and wherever it needs. AMC ensures the Army remains the best equipped and best sustained fighting force in the world. Lieutenant General Mohan is also the senior commander of Redstone Arsenal, a federal center of excellence, home to more than 70,000 organizations specializing in aviation, missiles, space, logistics, and law enforcement. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Chris Mohan. Well, how's everybody doing today? No. I, I got to admit, for the last day of AUSA, this is a pretty good room. So, uh, so hopefully you, uh, you won't decide to go ahead and flee as we get, to, uh, get through this uh, panel. Just, sir, just give them the signal. We'll lock the doors. We'll lock the doors. That's a great idea. <laughs> hey, so, um, so I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, this, is, this is an incredibly important discussion that we're going to have that is vital to our national security. Uh, as we talk about the capabilities of the organic industrial base and how we are increasingly projecting that capability all the way down to the tactical edge. Um, General Singh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, and uh, thank you and the entire AUSA team uh, for what you do uh, for our soldiers, our civilians, and our families. It's an incredibly powerful organization and uh, it, is, it is not lost on us um, about how AUSA is all in uh, to supporting us. And so I want to thank you guys for that. Um, look, we all know the world um, is incredibly dangerous. Uh, I, have, 
I've been in the Army uh, for about 35 years, and I've never seen a more dynamic and dangerous world than what we have right now. Um, as Tony Hale will say it, we could be in conflict not in one, not in two, but three COCOMs tonight simultaneously. And so, uh, so we have to be prepared for that complexity, um, and we have to uh, be incredibly dynamic in the way that we provide support uh, to the warfighter all the way down to the tactical edge. You've also heard the chief talk about how the Army is continuously transforming and adapting why the flexibility is necessary in, in the world that we live in. Um, the kind of discussions that we've been having over the last three days, um, the kind of relationships we made, I get to see a lot of old friends, I learn a lot. Also, it's, it's uh, striking to me how much risk that we are carrying as an Army and I like to say that, uh, and I'm very proud of it, to say that the, the Army carries the rucksack for the nation. And, uh, and our rucksack's heavy right now. And so we have to do everything in the sustainment community, and it's a community, uh, an enterprise, uh, to do everything possible to support our warfighter so that we are prepared to go to combat tonight in one, two, or three locations around the globe. Um, look, we've got a, uh, a great panel. Um, I know all of them personally. Um, I put, you know, put their names on a list um, because of the value they will add to this discussion. Um, and that includes our moderator, uh, uh, General Clark Masters, who has been a mentor of mine as, as we've both grown up in the, uh, in the Army. Um, they have decades of experience, um, all the way from the very tactical, all the way to the very strategic. Um, and, and, uh, and I think that will come out today in their comments. But as we think about what the OIB is, I'd like to kind of uh, to frame the discussion um, about why it's so important. Um, the organic industrial base is a network of, of facilities that overhaul, modernize, and upgrade our weapons system. Um, it doesn't just make them new, uh, it integrates also new technology into them. Uh, as an example, the conversions that are currently taking place at Red River where we're converting um, A2 Bradleys into A4 Bradleys. Um, the OIB, OIB, organic, it's Army grown, Army owned, and with our contractor partners in some cases, it is Army operated. It's also massive, and you see this picture, 23 depots, arsenals, and ammunition plants around, around the globe. Uh, as uh, Patricia said, $300 billion worth of facilities and infrastructure, and it's strategically located around our country, as you can see. And we're talking about everything from radi radios, radars, tanks, cannon tubes, munitions, small arms, all the things that we need to fight and win. Some people like to call it our nation's insur insurance policy. I like to call it our surge capacity, um, because I think um, uh, insurance is something you, you only use when, uh, when things go bad. We use the OIB every single day, and you're gonna see that. Um, now look, that surge capacity is absolutely necessary because as, as defense priorities and defense funding um, goes up and goes down, in some cases, if I was running a private business um, and work dried up for Bradley's and we weren't gonna see work for Bradley's for another three years, I would do something to the organization and maybe sell it, maybe get rid of it, maybe bring it down so we could do other things. We don't do that in the organic industrial base because we can't shut it down. We cannot shut down the nation's surge capacity because we don't know when that threat is gonna emerge uh, around the world. And because, again, uh, we never know when a war is gonna start or when we're gonna take or, and, or when we or our allies are gonna suddenly need things like millions of rounds of ammunition, hundreds of armored vehicles, um, that, uh, that, that we have provided, for example. Um, and if our Army is not ready, um, uh, it's, again, it's an incredibly dangerous world that we're in. If our Army's not ready, we could potentially lose the first fight, and, uh, and we cannot allow that to happen. Um, the other piece that, uh, that I, I want to point out to you is our OIB is not only, it's, it's not static. It is not static. Um, our OIB is exponentiary as well. And go to the next slide. Over the past year, at any given time, we've, we're tracking the numbers now because I think we need to tell our story. At any given time, I have about 600 of my teammates that are operating around the world, 30 different countries, um, in literally every other place, and they're operating in a place that they don't live. 
That means that we have projected that capability from one of our depots, arsenals, or, or plants forward uh, to the tactical edge to do certain things. And while we're doing that, uh, not only do we learn, uh, but we also save the Army a lot of money and time at the tactical level. So let me give you an example. Uh, just last year, we sent a team from Corpus Christi Army Depot in Texas uh, to South Korea to repair a Chinook helicopter that needed depot-level maintenance. Depot-level maintenance that had to be done by our artisans. Um, the old way was we would put that helicopter on a boat or we would fly it back to Corpus Christi and we'd do that work. Uh, we fixed it in 13 days. Uh, the team fixed it in 13 days versus the 220 days that it would have taken if we would have had to ship it all the way back. And we saved a significant amount of money uh, in the process, like over $2 million. One helicopter saving over $2 million. That's the power of the expeditionary OIB, and I think you'll hear some more of this uh, uh, from the panel. General Laylor will talk about how the OIB is being used in Europe and Indo-Pacific and about preparations for deployment and readiness, uh, the way that we're driving readiness down through capabilities, not only with tactical units, but augmentation of our capability into theirs to generate combat power and, and deliver those ready combat formations that we've been charged to do. Um, but we have to face the reality that our OIB is old. Um, our facilities uh, have not been modernized in a lot of cases in, in years, um, if, in decades, if not just years. Um, so you're going to hear us talk about our OIB modernization strategy. So we're, we have embarked on a 15-year, $18 billion strategy to update and upgrade our organic industrial base. Um, and again, our Army's capability. And that's everything from, from uh, water lines and sewer lines to buildings to new manufacturing capabilities to cyber protection. But we're also uh, updating and addressing our workforce to make sure that we have the, the necessary workforce for, for the future that will drive our capability into the future, the next generation. Uh, we're doing that as well. And this is where, from industry, this is where we need your help. Um, I worry that in some cases, as we look out through that 15-year program, that we're not quite sure what our weapon systems are going to look like in 15 years. And so we need help in being able to visualize and see what the potential requirements are so that we can make the right decisions now for procurement so that we don't buy the wrong machines um, because technology is rapidly changing every single day. I, command, I was very fortunate to command a depot, and for context, um, just a few short years ago, we bought our first 3D printer, and it cost $30,000, and we were very proud of it. You can buy that same printer right now for about $300. Technology is rapidly changing. <laughs> And it, it wasn't that long ago that I commanded a depot, but, <laughs> but technology is rapidly, uh, is rapidly changing. Um, so, so in short, we need your help to help us inform how we, how we link our, our depots, uh, how we buy the right uh, machinery, the right capability, how we train our workforce, uh, and then how we continue to prepare ourselves for the future. Um, and with that, I want to say again, thank everybody for being here and I'm going to turn it over to uh, the panel moderator. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Sir, thank you. Um, were we going to play a video? Not yet. Not yet? Okay, sorry. It's on my script to say play the video. Um, well, thank you again, sir. I will now turn it over to the moderator, Major General Retired, Clark Lee Masters, consulting employee for Lidos. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. So I've got the best job in the room today. So all I have to do is sit here and look really, really good. And these guys <laughs> got to answer all the hard questions. So just a couple of uh, administrative points before we get started. Uh, first, think of some really, really hard questions as they're talking. <laughs> Uh, there, there's an opportunity, you can either write it on a card and hand it to one of our people, just raise it up and they'll grab it and bring it up to me, or there's opportunity with microphones around the room. If you've got a question, when we get to the question and answer period, and that's where we really want to get to because that's where the great discussion comes out, uh, just stand up, walk to one of the mics, one of the folks will bring it to you and then ask your question uh, for the group and, and speak loud and clear so they can hear you. Uh, my also job is to keep us on time, and the main thing is 
to get through the remarks and get to the questions and answers where we know the important stuff will come out. I want to introduce, even though most of you know our panel, I want to quickly introduce each of our panel members, uh, starting with Major General Laylor, uh, the Commander Tank Automotive and Armaments Command, headquartered up in Warren, beautiful Warren, Michigan, uh, a significant owner of uh, the organic industrial base that uh, uh, General Mohan just talked about, uh, four depots, two arsenals, an integrated logistics support center uh, responsible for managing a large part of the readiness of our combat platforms, soldier weapons uh, across the Army. Um, uh, so very much in tune with the topic. And the best thing about this panel is we're not talking about the theory of doing it. These gentlemen are going to talk to you about how it's actually being done now and have been done and the lessons learned. Uh, no stranger to transformation and no stranger to supporting units uh, joint forces, allies, and Army forces in contact, uh, as you can imagine, across all of our leaders in the Army. Uh, so General Laylor uh, uh, has been in command up there just a little bit over a year, and man, he's burning off the leather of his shoes. So General Laylor, welcome to the panel. Thanks, sir. Uh, our, our next panel member, uh, Major General Ron Reagan, commander of the 21st Theater Sustainment Command, headquartered in uh, Kaiserslautern, beautiful Kaiserslautern, Germany. Uh, as you know, within the theater of operation that, that uh, General Reagan is responsible for, there's just a few things going on and a lot of activity. <laughs> uh, great, again, operational experience supporting every type of force you can imagine, and great lessons learned and great teamwork between uh, the organic industrial base and some of his folks already. Um, certainly welcome General Reagan to the panel as Thank well. You. And our last panel member, uh, Dr. Alex Miller, uh, amazing, uh, exciting guy that's going to get you fired up about technology. He was handpicked by the Chief of Staff of the Army to be the, the, the Chief's uh, Chief Technology Officer, uh, has been involved with a lot of things within the organic industrial base, advanced manufacturing. Um, I don't know how many folks out there want to say anything, but he's a <laughs> Purdue grad. If you got anything you want to say about that, go right ahead and say it. Shout out, spoiler <laughs> out. Shout, shout out, Ronnie. Uh, he began his career in around 2008, uh, supporting the Army, uh, both operationally through technology and intelligence insertions, uh, led some very key initiatives uh, in Iraq and in, Af in Afghanistan, transforming our Army in contact, including the modernization of intelligence architecture. Uh, he has all the credentials that you need to be the chief technology officer, uh, master's in systems engineering from John Hopkins, and a doctor in technology from Purdue. Uh, he's also very published in uh, biometric security, blockchain technology, and has been supporting the industrial base, not only organic, but defense industrial base throughout his career. Dr. Miller, welcome to the panel. Thank you. And with that said, I'd like to turn it over to General Laylor for some opening comments. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks. Appreciate it for uh, coming out here today. Like uh, General Mohan said, we got a good crowd, so we should we should have sold tickets, or we could have somebody out the door, uh, you know, working some secondary market. But it's good. Thanks for uh, thanks for attending today, and for uh, for AUSA for having me, for uh, hosting us, for having this panel. Appreciate my teammates up here joining me uh, very much, and for General Masters for taking us on. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for doing that. Do I want to thank the uh, you know also to uh, General Mohan, the AMC team, for having me. Uh, represent our team and what we're doing. It's, it's, uh, it's the whole AMC team is doing tremendous work at the point of attack every day around the world, like, uh, like you said, and uh, we are emblematic of that. You know, Ron is my, uh, my teammate, uh, literally battle buddy and friend as we kind of, you know, driving things forward in, in terms of setting conditions in Europe and, uh, and couldn't be a partner with anyone better. And Dr. Miller, sir, thanks for your, your investment with us and taking the time to come see us and, uh, you know, talk to us, coach us, and, uh, and help us stay aligned with where we're going, but also to encourage us to keep going and keep pushing the envelope on what we're doing, especially in the advanced manufacturing realm. Um, you know, and I think the, uh, the thing about it, I think as we talk about what we do, of course, like I said, we, TACOM is, uh, you know, we do, what we do at the, uh, at the edge is, you know, we're pushing every day trying to bring capability to that tactical edge. Um, you know, we do it with partners, though. We don't do it alone. Everything we do is by, with, and through the, the team here. So whether it's, you know, at the Army staff level, it's, 
you know, the AMC staff level. It's, it's with our, our joint partners, you know, Defense Logistics Agency. Sir, thanks for being here. I mean, all, all the partners that we have uh, to make this go every day. You know, TACOM's your partner. You know, we work with the ASCCs by, with, and through them every day. I just got back from a 16 day tour through Indo PACOM with our team and, and literally working through, uh, you know, set the theater type operations and how we can better posture ourselves. You know, and we'll talk about what we're doing in Europe. Ron will hit on that. But um, we're doing the same things in the Pacific and we're doing the same things in, uh, we're working towards the same things in CENTCOM. Uh, we're your partner and, we're, and, you know, TACOM is open for businesses, like I always say. Um, you know, I got two. I got. I got two priorities every day. Um, I got two priorities every day: Army readiness and Ukraine in contact. And that is what I've been working on uh, night and day for 15 months with our team, and uh, and to deliver effects. And to deliver effects, you got to bring those effects to where the units are, where people need them, where people can take the best advantage of them. It does no good when they're sitting in uh, Warren, Michigan. As you can see here, uh, over time, we try to uh, better display where we're at. Uh, and over, over time, I actually, this, this chart, if we had a build on it, it could get even busier, but we, uh, we, we scaled it back just to give you a picture of, you know, we're not just the TACOM that was at the depots and arsenals. Uh, we are forward extended uh, every day. The sun doesn't sleep on it. And, uh, on, you know, on a given day to support Army readiness and Ukraine in contact, you know, we, we, you know I'll talk to you. We got, we got teams forward, you know, between the sizes of about two-man teams out to 12-person teams. I think on a given day, we've been averaging about 60 teams forward uh, throughout most of the last several months with about 240 or almost 250 of those people that uh, General Mohan referenced above the 600 are from TACOM out there every day. And given the expanse of what we do in our portfolio with ground system equipment, if a soldier, you know, drives it, shoots it, wears it, TACOM supports it, and there's things that don't even fit into that that we support, uh, that, that portfolio will, will, you know, get you to extend out. So. Um, you know, look, we, we, and our priorities there for Army readiness, Ukraine in contact, they tie in nicely with uh, AMC's priorities, but also with the chiefs. And in terms of, uh, you know, uh, you know, you think about war fighting, uh, continuous transformation, delivering ready combat formations, strengthening the profession um, to, you know, enable that forward, that war fighting, enable that readiness forward. Um, we, we need to be able to produce at the point of production. We need to be able to extend and get our capabilities out there and uh, we are delivering those effects. As an you know, example, I talked about those, those repairing forward. We are repairing forward. Um, you know, we, I think over time, you know, as, uh, you know, during the 20 years of warfare we had, uh, you know, prior to this new era of, uh, you know, ongoing era of crisis and competition here that we're working through, you know, a, a lot of the capabilities at the national level were moved back to CONUS based. Now it's time to rethink them and, and re-push them out and make sure that we have the capabilities forward to support those units in the field, and we're doing it. I talked about our flyaway team capability that's alive, well, and responsive. Um, it's in deeds, not words. If you ask and we can deliver, we'll get it there. Uh, we got everything going right now from Hurricane Helene support with 3rd ESC to, like I said, what we're doing on a daily basis in the COCOMs. And then you're going to watercraft, uh, just because I got to give a shout out to you transporters all in the room there, watercraft. <laughs> Um, near and dear to my heart, um, you know, I, I, I think I, 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 like I said, I definitely, um, you know, set a personal record in the last month of how many watercraft I've been on around the world walking them. And the idea is, look, if you're going to project support and repair forward, you've got to be able to do it on all systems. And, uh, you know, think about, you've got to also repair those systems where the crews are and where the COCOMs operate, not just on the east and west coast of the United States. So in the last year, you know, we moved our own money internal to take on and reestablish where we could do maintenance forward in the COCOMs. Right now, you got five watercraft in maintenance around the world in the Pacific. They're not on the east and the west coast. There's four in Japan as we speak. There's one down in uh, Korea. And we're looking at other areas where we can do it. We're going to do one in Hawaii next year coming up. And of course, we'll be working on LSVs and other, other ships in Australia, uh, building on a partnership down there uh, over the next year. The other thing we're looking, we are the other thing that to move things forward, we're moving our authorities forward, allowing units, if they can show and demonstrate they got the capabilities, the tools, the training, and we can certify that, we'll give you the repair authority forward um, to, to make sure if we can uh, work it so that we don't have to evac a system, we'll do that. But again, it's a, it's a you know, we got to make sure we got some checks and balances on that, on that system. And then, of course, advanced manufacturing production, which I think we're becoming, you know, is a lot of what people are knowing what we're doing out there at the point of need every day. 
And uh, within the last eight months, we have really, really um, pushed that forward and started uh, serving as a catalyst for, I think, change in the Army and for, uh, for pushing, making sure that we could, you know, through our concept of battle damage repair fabrication, you know, the idea is, hey, we can make a part right now and get a mission, make a, make a system mission capable, we do it. And, uh, you know, from the Joint Manufacturing Technology Center, you know, at Rock Island Arsenal, uh, on, under uh, Dave Goddard's leadership, we, you know, I've, we've resourced them. We also have unleashed the shackles and said, look, if we can, uh, we know there's things that the Army already has the technical data package on, we can just manufacture. If there's ones that we don't, uh, you know, then we can use reverse engineering to solve our problems, or we work with the partners, uh, because much of what we do every day is buy with and through our industry partners. We, we solve the problems, but they're actively making, you know, parts, and, and through our program, if you're not familiar with it, it's worth you taking a look at what we're doing. You know, it was a 30 July maintenance information message that went out there to told, told, told the Army and the Joint Force how to start taking advantage of us, and you can do it. And not only that, right now, it's free. Uh, if, you can, uh, if, if you need us and we can make it, we'll, pr we'll produce it at our cost, our, our labor, and you'll get it. And then you can put that, uh, you can get your system mission cable while we maintain uh, consistent demand signal and pressure on our, on our industrial base, on our OEMs, on our vendors, on our, but on our, our industry partners, because we need both. Never, our, never is advanced manufacturing designed to be a replacement for, our, for what we do with industry, but it is gonna darn well supplement it, and it's doing it right now. And we have to be able to do that and have that uh, to our kit bag. And, I'm, you know, and we're doing it in TACOM, but our other partners are doing it as well and working through it. And uh, inside our other LCMCs are, like I said, we're emblematic of the larger AMC family. And then, of course, uh, and then the other thing, like I said, industry. Uh, we don't do anything, you know, in TACOM by ourselves. We, uh, like I said, there's, there's partnerships. I don't know, if, you know, I, I hope there's some good industry partners in the room here. You know, we got them all over the place. Obviously, where we're located in Detroit, we're in the hub of all, the automotive industry still. We got our partners in there with uh, General Dynamics. I think I get more cards and letters from them than, than I do from my, uh, my extended family. But if you're out there, thank you all for the, your partnership. <laughs> You know, and for uh, all those we work with, because it's a supply chain, it's it's maintenance capability forward, and it's uh, and and you know what I tell the industry partners all the time is, hey, I need you to deliver, meet the capabilities, but also please, you got to share some risk, and we got to we got to move some capability forward. So when I think of levels of maintenance in a future fight, you know, it's not just field and sustainment; it's more than that. There's a third level in there, I think now, and it's it's all the capabilities we had, direct support, general support in the old days, and moving that forward. We'll rename it whatever it's supposed to be in 2024, but it's not, it's not, you know, we have the capability there, but it's also tied in with industry. And if industry's out there in places like Eastern Europe where we have armor going in and they're putting capability in there, then we'll take advantage of it and we'll leverage it. It's part of our concept of support. But the shared risk is, you know, obviously your capital investment to the process. So we look forward to the conversation. Again, thanks so much. I appreciate the partners I got up here and uh, we're committed to excellence. Thanks so much, awesome. sir. Thanks. General Reagan. Okay, well, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Lieutenant General Mohan, Cindy, good to see you. Um, General Layler, Dr. Miller, Major General Retired Singh, Major General Retired LeMasters, teammates, allies, good to see our Polish friends in the audience. And I really do, just looking out in the audience, it is so good to see so many because you seem like family and you truly are family. Um, right now, I, I feel like I'm a little bit jet lag. I woke up at two o'clock every morning. <laughs> I did do PT, and I do feel like I'm going to sleep right now, but so I'm gonna to stick to the script, right? Um, but my remarks are prepared, but they are to kind of frame how we view things from a European perspective, but it's much bigger than just one part of the globe, right? It's about enabling things in the Indo-Pacific. It's about making sure that our CINCOM teammates are right. And it's really about making sure that the Army is prepared for the future. So I'm gonna give you a context of just kind of how we see it from the Indo, I mean, from the Indo-Pacific, from the European theater, but it's really um, much bigger than that. Right now in the 21st Theater Sustainment Command, where is the linchpin of sustainment in Europe. And then ever since February of 24th of 2022, we have really been executing our wartime mission at a scale and scope that has not been seen since this century. I mean, every day we're moving with our coalition partners and allies, 
we're moving tons and tons of material. A lot of it that originated here in the homeland, but they're moving it by air, they're moving it by ground, they're moving it by rail, they're moving it day and they're moving it at night. We're doing integration tasks that, you know, we, I, I never grew up in the military where we were integrating combat systems and then rapidly pushing them forward to get in contact. And then also on the backside, doing the battle damage assessment and repair and enabling our partners to be able to maintain the combat power. And they're doing that every day. However, the United States Army and Europe and the 21st TSC are in a rapid race to transform how we fight and what we fight with. Emerging technologies already visible on the battlefields in Ukraine are rapidly changing the character of war and requires an immediate transformation in the way that we fight and the way that we sustain. Technologies like autonomous vehicles, robotics, drones, artificial intelligence, quantum computing will change the next conflict. Innovations and investments that we fail to make today will be adaptations that we will be forced to make under fire and the price will be paid in coalition lives lost. The challenge of transformation and the race to modernize is one of our greatest responsibilities that we have today. Logistics is hard, but it's even, as, as observed in Ukraine, it's even harder when you're in contact with the enemy. So we must make smart investments now, we must modernize now, we must transform now. Because of the importance of logistics in winning, hit, in, in winning wars, history has always showed us that logistics has always been contested. It's not a new thing. The, it, given the risk of, 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 of contested logistics, the material that we currently have in theater may be the only material that we have in the time of crisis. We may not be able to guarantee the free flow of material across the Atlantic. We might not be able to guarantee the free flow of material across the Pacific either. We're already seeing contested logistics taking shape across Europe. Make no doubt, and our Polish friends know it, there's an enemy that wants to stop us from being able to de deliver lethal aid to Ukraine. Our adversaries observe us every day across the theory, theater. They pursue information advantage in the cyber realm. They seek to dis disrupt the political unity across NATO. And th as we think about enablement, large-scale conflict across the European theater, we must evolve beyond just moving material and think about all the complexities of sustainment through all phases of the operation, specifically phase zero, and then not only as a, a U.S. Army force, but part of a joint and multinational force. Our ultimate success forward on the battlefield will be determined on our ability to set the theater before the first bullet is ever fired. In other words, we must have the right things in the right quantities, in the right places, with the right agreements and with the right partners, partners like AMC, DLA, Transcom, and then all of our allied partners. I believe the greatest enemy, the greatest enemy is time, and time waits for no one. And because of this, we must act now. The 21st TSC is using both you know, we're on a sustainment campaign using both interior, exterior, you know, lines of communication as part of a joint force to set the theater for a contested logistics operating environment in support of all three of NATO's regional plans. Our success will not only be determined on the tactical edge, but it's gonna start here in the homeland. It's gonna start with the organic industrial base it's going to start in the depots, the arsenals, the ammunition plants, and the thread that connects that all the way together to the forward tactical edge. When we're thinking about the future of sustainment and military operations, I want to leave you with three critical themes. First, effective maintenance will be one of the determining vectors, factors that will allow us to enable victory. Second, 
in large scale combat operations, we need at least three levels of robust maintenance capability. I do not believe, based upon the things that I'm seeing in Europe, that two levels is enough. And third, we're witnessing a change in the nature of war that's driven by, by advancements in drones, robotics, artificial intelligence. These systems are changing the way that we fight, but more importantly for this on, our audience, it's changing the way that we sustain, and it will change the, the way that we sustain in the future. I want to share you just a, a real quick story, and for the sake of his protection, I'm just going to call him Yuri. But Yuri was a mechanic that, was, that lived in Kyiv, and he was recruited you know, shortly after the Re Russian invasion. Um, he was good at fixing everything that had an engine. Yuri was put on a combat mission you know, in support of the operations that were going on in Kharkiv, and he was the only mechanic in that convoy. And then that convoy came under heavy artillery attack. He was wounded. His convoy was disrupted, but he, he managed to fix the combat systems and maintain that combat power. He was a mechanic and they were in the end, they were able to accomplish their mission. So Yuri, and the reason why I tell you this uh, story about Yuri is there's many Ukrainians right now that are, are, that are living the same thing. They're in contact right now fighting for their survival. But Yuri was the right person. He had the right tools. He had the right experience that made an immediate operational impact. The next conflict, I believe, that the site that will win will be the site that can supply combat power at the speed of relevance to the point of need to maintain that endurance for as long as it takes. Effective maintenance is the backbone of operational success as we see in the conflict in Ukraine. And it has served as a master class of the importance of having a very robust maintenance system. But this lesson is not new, right? I would argue that during, you gotta think back during the last major tank battle that the US had. It was a battle of 73 Easting as part of the Gulf War. It was often remembered for its operational build brilliance it's extraordinary, tact, extraordinary tactical success. If you remember, the United States military put a, a beat down on the Iraqi Republican Guard. But what I, want, what, I, what I focused on was that the strength that's never really told is that was, it was enabled by a very, very robust logistical system that, that had a very, very robust supply system that enabled them to achieve the things that they did. And if I remember back, they had a three-tiered maintenance system that enabled them. And if I remember the M1 tanks and during, that, during the Gulf War, they had over 1,800 M1 tanks, 60,000 pieces of, of US Army equipment that was employed in there. And they maintained that operational reach through a robust supply system and a robust maintenance system. Today, our forces are much more advanced and our technology is much more complicated, but the lessons remain the same, whether it's a truck, whether it's a drone, or whether, if a, or, or whether it's a robot, if it's not operational on today's battlefield, it will be killed. In a three-tier maintenance system, I, it, I'm talking about organizational, intermediate maintenance and depot level maintenance. At the organizational level, it's all about you know, doing the things that we do on a daily basis. It's a preventive maintenance checks. It's being able for the soldier at the organizational level to be able to maintain their equipment far forward. It's about leader engagement. At the intermediate level, it's all about the regeneration of combat power far, far forward. And this is where the organic industrial base can play a huge part. In every large scale conflict, I believe every war eventually becomes a war of attrition. And regenerating combat far power as far forward as possible is, is hugely important. And it's gonna require a distributed maintenance facilities, 
facilities that have um, certain repair authorities that I'm working very closely with General Laylor on, special repair authorities to be able to, to conduct things like component repairs of engines, being able to fix wiring harnesses far forward and not being over -reli overly reliant on the supply system to do that. It's about having the right tools, tools like data analytics, predictive tools that allow you to see a problem before the problem manifests itself. It's about having the right workforce with the right knowledge, the right skills, the right experience, and the right technology investment such as augmented reality that allows me to see things and, and fix things remotely. It's about having additive manufacturing capabilities in 3D printing and the right locations forward in theater. At the depot level, where General Laylor is responsible for, I believe it's about having the right partnerships that he talked about with industry, access to the right technical data, and being able to produce at scale if necessary to support the theaters forward. And this is all enabled by having a data-centric organic industrial base, what General Mohan had talked about that the Army's making huge investments in. Recently, I was able to meet with a logistician from the Ukrainian army with some of our NATO allied partners. And one of the partners asked him, knowing what you know today, what would have you invested in five years ago? The senior Ukrainian official said, that's a fair question. Number one, I would have invested in ammunition production and stockpiles. In other words, magazine depth. Number two, I would have invested in maintenance capabilities at mul multiple locations, distributed and connected. Number three, I would have invested in hardened storage and command and control infrastructure, preferably underground or mobile. The Ukraine war has reminded us of Universal's truths. The first truth it reminds me of is that we always underestimate the scale of munitions and the material that is required to win on the battlefield. Second, the site that can produce the most for the longest will probably have an advantage on the battlefield. And then third, technology and innovation will always be a decisive factor in current and future wars. The battlefield of tomorrow, shaped by drones, Robotic technologies are making operations more efficient, reducing the risk to soldiers and our personnel. Imagine a world where drones are not only the eyes in the sky, but the vehicles are delivering spare parts directly from the front lines. Autonomous robots programmed to perform advanced diagnostics, maintenance, and recovery far forward on the battlefield, reducing the risk to our soldiers. As we begin to integrate technologies like AI, predictive maintenance, maintenance, additive manufacturing, we need to ensure that the digital thread is connected all the way from the organic industrial base far forward to the foxhole. The mechanic of tomorrow may not need to know how to fix engines, but the mechanic of tomorrow might, need, be able, might have to be able to program software on a tactical drone. Our approach to maintenance is evolving, and we also need the OIB to evolve as well as we know it is, sir. Um, the world is increasingly complex and fast moving, driven by technology. And I believe that effective maintenance is essential to our success. And so is a strong logistical tell enabled at every node. We are at a critical juncture. The lessons from Ukraine are clear. The lessons from history are clear. The technologies are advancing so fast and our adversaries are paying attention. We must ensure that the joint sustainment enterprise is connected, connected all the way from the OIB to the foxhole. And I'll leave you with this last thought. We must remember that it's infantry that wins battles, but it's the logistics that's going to win the war. Thank you. Thanks, General Reagan. Appreciate it. Dr. Miller, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Awesome. 
hey, we have the most important job in the world. Close with and destroy the enemy. That's it. That's what it comes down to. Um, can you actually go back one slide? I want to start. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to, uh, yeah. So, so this right here, why can't we do that? It's a real answer. Why can't we do it? Because our industrial base isn't subsidized by the CCP. But every time you buy something off of Amazon, you're subsidizing that. So what we're talking about here is that connectivity from our American industrial base down to how we fight and win wars. Think about it. So I do not care I, at all if you consider yourself part of the OIB or the DIB. You are part of the American industrial base. And that is the only way that we can think about this to fight and win wars. Um, can you go forward to mine, please? Okay. Beans, bullets, binary. So we think about the edge. This is the edge, right? So, so number one, that's AAAB in Iraq, Al Assad Air Base. Number two, that's J Town. Three is Alaska. Four is is out in Balakatan in the, in the Philippines. Five is is uh, Kaya. It's near and dear to, to a lot of our hearts. Um, number six there is is actually Mogadishu. Seven is Gaza, uh, the the pier. Um, Last week, this, this, that was the last picture on here. Where's number eight? Where is it? Say it again. It's home. Mm -hmm. It's us. And number, number nine, that's a Thad battery out in Saudi Arabia. We don't get to pick where the enemy wants us to fight. We have to be ready to fight anywhere. Now, I, I like the notion of us learning from the Ukrainians, and I like the notion of us learning from, from the Israelis because we've spent 20 years in the fight, and now we get to, to watch and learn in real time. Um, if you ask a kid who's failing a class what they would have, been, what they would have done better to, to not fail the class, they normally say, study more. Maybe the right answer is don't take the class, right? I do not want to prepare to be three years into a war and figure out how to win it from there. I want to figure out how to either deter a war or win it from the outset. So as so we think about what the edge is, it is everywhere, all the time, home and abroad. That is where the, the industrial base has to be able to support. Can you go to my next slide, please? So let's, let's, let's talk about a story. So let's, let's say we're two years in the future. So the air defenders on their, on their sweet new LTAMS radar, they pick up something and they, they, they return fire. They intercept that ballistic missile. And because the right thing to do is kill what kills us, we return offensive fires. Bam, bam, bam. And then you've got your, your, your Devardi S3 on his tack because we can't have this big signature and we don't have super jock Taj Mahals anymore looking down and going, ooh, I better get out of here because I just shot and I made a really big signature and I need to move. Well, they, they mount up in, in their ISVs because those are light and they're maneuverable and they start pulling everything and they move. They set up their next place and they have, they have their robotic systems going out and doing mine clearing. So they got their robotic MICLICs and they've got all the drone convoys out there. And then they set up and, and their new command post is literally two, in, two ISVs and a tarp. So that's a real scenario that the OIB and the DIB and the industrial base have to support because what's going to happen is you got comms requirements, Somebody's going to drive away and rip out an Ethernet cord from a router, and that's okay. We're going to leave a whole bunch of stuff. Door handles are going to break. Blasting caps are going to break. Gas covers are going to break. And we have to be able to think about what that means to go forward because some conditions, that makes your vehicle an MC, right? Somebody goes, you can't use that vehicle. I, I, who's been told they can't use something and then they keep using it deployed? <laughs> <laughs> So this is, this is a real story that we have to think through and actually put our minds to. And we think about the technology. The technology is easy. Technology is a credit card problem when we get into a fight. The people, the processes, and the policies, that's what we're fighting up against. Making sure the people are well-trained and, and incentivized to be creative to fight and win. The policies that were probably written for some good reason, right? It's like, it's like every Friday safety brief, they exist for some reason. Uh, whether or not that reason is relevant or recent is to be determined. And then making sure that the, the processes actually match what our intent is. So can you go to the next slide? Okay, this is technology slide. So one, advanced and digital engineering, right? 3D printing is, is neat at best. 
I can go buy 3D printers. In fact, at, at JRTC, the, the TACOM team were actually printing parts for the unit in the, for the, in, they, they were cheating. They were doing printing parts for the RTU and for Geronimo. I don't think that's fair, but uh, uh, like that's a thing like that we can do. Army <laughs> unit. Okay. Okay. <laughs> What's next? Digital engineering. I, I've been having a lot of, of philosophical debates on where we should be asking for what type of tech data pa packages for digital engineering because like the, the pure bureaucrat in me says the more we own, the faster we can go. But that's wholly un-American. Right? I want industry to be really, really innovative and feel ownership in their intellectual property. I don't want it. Why don't I want it? Because I can't do anything with it. Right? We could buy up all the intellectual property ever. Doesn't mean we can do anything with it. But I want you to be good OEM teammates. I want you to, to keep updating that. Have pride in your work. Because when you have pride in your work, it's really good. Second one, telemaintenance. I have seen some incredible things that our boys and girls are doing for, for folks overseas. Incredible, eye-watering. Makes me really proud to be you know, part of the US Army and, and an American. Um, we need more of it, and it needs to be a little bit more sophisticated than, than just throwing a hollow lens on and saying, hey, you know, screw here, don't screw there. What that means is we have to be able to digitize some of these product books and make sure that they're shareable and that they're translatable, and that anybody anywhere can, ex can access them and make meaningful changes with it. But the other part is, some of our technologies are getting so complex on the user side that they're, they're not useful after they get hit or hurt or destroyed. And what I mean by that is, is my, my phone's a pretty complex piece of kit, right? It's got a bunch of radios, a, a pretty neat battery in it. Um, there's AI chips, and I use air fingers quotes because everybody uses that term. Um, it's a pretty complex piece of kit. If I roll over it in a tracked vehicle, which may or may not have happened to me a couple years ago at Yuma, um, I'm just going to buy a new one. That's it. I'm just going to buy a new one. So the more complex it is on the user-facing side, the more emotional attachment we get to it, and, and we, we don't allow ourselves to just go, hey, maybe it should just be really cheap and throw it away. Because if I break a drone or if I foul a tube, I just want to be able to get a new tube or a new drone. Because the more time I spend repairing it, the, the more time that I am not creating a continuous rate of fire to fight and win. Um, fourth, uh, third picture there, big drone, autonomous resupply. Like We have to think about how we do those routes and how do we move that forward. Because resupply should be really, really, really quick. You know, it, 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 It's a scary thought to hear the bulk carrier group click because uh, there's nothing left. But if you knew that there was a drone that was going to fly out and bring you another box, that's, that's, that's the kind of type, that's the kind of things that we're looking for, which means that there's, there's autonomy requirements, there's route planning requirements, there's comms requirements, there's, hey, get there at the right time. That means there's, there's, there's local end item. Hey, how am I doing? Am I doing round counting? Am I doing magazine counting? Is it a time thing? Is it a window of opportunity thing? Again, that's, that's some of its technology. A lot of it's people, policy, Fourth one, uh, lightweight mobility, right? Logistics is heavy. I, 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 I am an intelligence professional by trade. I was picked up to, to work the job I am and I love it. But before I came into this job, the most that I had ever dealt with logistics was, was hearing war stories from my dad about how people would steal fuel by putting rocks into the tanks <laughs> and, and the, the dipsticks would measure the right thing because displacement by uh, displacement of, of liquid. We got to be lighter because if you sit in the same spot for too long, you're going to get killed. So thinking about how we do lightweight mobility for logistics and sustainment, that is a technology, process, people, policy problem. That is the nexus of, of all the things that are hard. Next one, power generation and storage. This is a scary one. Um, anybody in here? In here, heard of the, the C2 fix? Yeah, getting head nods. One of the things that we found really interesting is, is by doctrine, a brigade talk, now a main command post, is 4,000 square feet, right? So that's, that's, your, that's your main little area. You've got the ace off on the side. You've got the SIGOs over here. Um, you've got like six STTs. Everything's, you know, the, the ace is in double strand concertina wire. And then you have like 10 generators. 
Well, what we found is if you can turn the brigade main into a four vehicle array just backed up to each other, one generator works pretty well. And then you're not hauling a whole bunch of fuel because you've optimized how you're using your power. You're optimized when you're using your power. And oh, by the way, the, those ISVs are pretty sweet because you can plug things into it and their power budget allows you to actually run things off of the vehicle. The same way that we used to have the Humvee plugs, those ISVs can do that. So we're looking at things like hybrid ISVs, not fully electric. Let me be very clear. I did not see any charging ports in the middle of JRTC, nor have I seen them at Hohenfelds, nor have I seen them at NTC. <laughs> nope. If somebody can point them out, I'm happy to look at them. Next one, autonomy of all flavors. So there's a, there's a ground robot with a, with a good cannon on it. It's everything eight-year-old Alex ever wanted. Um, there's an autonomous landing craft with that, that MRAP blown off. We've got tons of boats. I had never met an Army mariner until I actually went out to, to see the, uh, the LSVs out in Hawaii. And then air, airborne. There's autonomy challenges that we can, we, the American industrial base, can conquer. But it, what it does not mean is that we should have a whole bunch of autonomy stacks fighting because those behaviors are really hard to control. And again, I do not want to own any of that intellectual property because we will foul it. We want you to be good partners and figure out how all of that works together. Top right, this is actually, um, shout out to 18th Airborne Corps. Uh, this is a screenshot from their, their LogX platform. Um, this is how they're helping the home team out in North Carolina. So it, 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 one of my, again, proudest moments as, a, as an Army civilian here, um, seeing 2101 and 2nd Brigade 10th Mountain and the 82nd um, jump in all their, their lightweight ISVs with all the comms architecture and go um, out to North Carolina and help. And this is one of the platforms that they're using to manage the log there. Um, we've got the rest of the American industrial bills helping us there. So your, your Walmarts, your Amazons, people who are doing incredible work in their daily lives, now we can actually take that and understand it and, and use it so that we're not trying to have this really bespoke set of, of processes or technologies. We want to do this at scale. And then again, the last one. Um, I love this robot because this is out at NTC. This was part of Project Convergence uh, Capstone 4 last year, or earlier this year, rather. Um, the focus there is that soldier, because that soldier is, is probably thinking, oh my God, how do I fix this thing? Um, because we were, we were going through validation of a lot of this technology, and we were asking, asking folks, how do you use it? How could you use it? What would you do with it? Um, what happens if it breaks? Where do you go? Um, and we cannot set up depot level maintenance for every robotic piece of kit. So as you're thinking through how you feel, how you engage with, with our soldiers, with your customers, with our users, um, always please, please, please think about um, that E4, that E5, that E6 who is in combat. Like everybody says conflict, but when you're being shot at, things change. So think about that customer and what they have to do and making sure that that piece of kit, if it's gonna stop working hard, make sure they know that because it's easy for you to assume risk if you're providing kit, but it's not your risk to assume it's theirs. So I'll stop there. Thanks for, for letting me be up here. Thanks, Dr. Miller. Great. Uh, so that's a lot to chew on. Uh, in our excitement to get to the panel and have the discussion, I think we missed showing a movie. So as we transition now into Q&A, so make sure to put your final touches on your questions. We're going to get ready to start on that. If we could cue up that movie, please. A soldier wears it, drives it, or shoots it. TACOM sustains it. We are Army's home of ground equipment systems management. Our mission is simple. We solve problems for the Army and make sure units have what they need to fight and win our nation's wars by delivering material readiness every day. Our heritage, rooted in the legacy of the automotive industry, is what ensures our continued commitment to excellence. With men and women located in more than 150 locations worldwide, we provide support to ready combat formations. TACOM is much more than just a logistics and sustainment organization. We are on the line with soldiers wherever they are stationed, standing shoulder to shoulder to provide support, training, 
and the information they need to repair mission-critical ground equipment and vehicles in the field. We also work hard and smart to repair ground vehicle systems at our depots and to manufacture whatever the Army needs at our arsenals. With locations in Alabama, Ohio, Texas, Illinois, California, and New York, TACOM is an integral part of the Army's organic industrial base. Our workforce of more than 15,000 soldiers and Department of Army civilians is Army Material Command's reliable combat enabler, providing whatever is needed to the field. At the end of the day, we are there to do more than just provide equipment and repairs. We are there to ensure that every combat formation in the Army is well equipped with the tanks and ground combat systems and parts they need. But our mission doesn't end there. We are the equipment and ground combat systems you see in front of American Legion, State Capitol buildings, and VFW halls. The flags each president receives at their inauguration. We provide rifles used by veterans groups for a 21-gun salute, and the medals your father or mother treasures from their days in the service. We are the uniforms soldiers wear proudly, the team behind the Army's advanced manufacturing efforts for vehicle parts, the producers of technical manuals and training videos on ground vehicles and equipment, the creators of telemaintenance systems, and the flyaway teams ready and able to answer the call anywhere in the world. We manage the supply chain and Army's ground combat systems during their entire life cycle, from inception to disposal. We ensure Army units are postured to win, and they are equipped resourced and ready when our nation calls. That's our goal every day. We are the U.S. Army Tank Automotive and Armaments Command, and we are committed to excellence. Right, give you awesome. a little pump right there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there, you go. There, you go. Fire there you go, Sergeant Major. <laughs> All right, we're now uh, transitioning to questions and answers. So I just, I'll I want, throw I want, my hand up. Anybody, please raise your hand. We've got microphones if you've got one. While they're figuring that out, I want to point out, we were told that three slides was too much. I didn't get a video. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I've been waiting 15 months for that video. That's, that's an unveiling right there. That's, that's a good time right there. That's a good video. <laughs> Any questions from you? I, we've got some coming up on cards, but anybody stand up? Got a question? Great. Well, let's start off with a few from the audience. Uh, and I can't think of a better way to start it than the question for the TACOM commander with that video going on. <laughs> you, you've talked to us as we've gone through the, the briefing on what you're doing. Um, where do you see this advancing to? What's the role of TACOM uh, that you'll have involved with making the decisions and moving repair capability forward to the tactical edge? And what are some of the next steps you're thinking about and capabilities you think will be the the next one to display for our combat formations. Yeah, thanks, sir. I think the, uh, you know, that's a good ones. I think the, you know, for us, uh, you know, I see us developing over time, serving as a, essentially the clearinghouse for all ground system functions. So if you're gonna, you know, I, where I'd see us on the manufacturing front, you know, and, and obviously, you know, in concert with uh, AMC, but, you know, to enable the vision of making sure that we can do distributed manufacturing forward. Right, an enterprise approach. So if we're the clearinghouse essentially for advanced manufacturing, whether you're talking ground systems or you know, anything in that realm, uh, being able to have a production run going at the strategic level at the Joint Manufacturing Technology, you know, Technology Center, those printers are now running you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But if that workload on a production run, you know, there's a, there's a um, piece to the 120 millimeter mortar that we that we uh, prototyped this year to help um, in terms of blast re you know blast reduction and reducing that for our operators and it was something that our engineers did uh, to help solve a problem and they made it out of titanium but that run took that production run took I think it took like four days right and so as they're running on that you know that time is money right so where else can we if we have other work to do where can we distribute that work I see that work going to a location in the theater, whether it's in PACOM or it's in UCOM or current COM, as I call CENTCOM. So, 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 <laughs> and, and uh, everyday COM. So, so the, you know, but, but, or, you know, maybe it's to, um, you know, a, a unit in, in here, but also maybe it's to a joint partner, 
you know, and maybe, or maybe it's, uh, you know, to one of our other LCMC partners where they're running it for us. But that's the kind of idea um, that I see us going to. I see our partnership with, uh, our partnership with DLA is only growing. You know, they're working with us to where we can be their source of supply on some items that might be long in the supply chain, and we're working through that with them right now. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's new. You know, that's forging the way forward in the future. So that's, you know, things on the supply chain on the horizon there. And then from the maintenance side, you know, I, I was talking to you about it earlier, sir, but, you know, when we went to uh, Indopaycom last week or 10 days ago, it's all kind of blurring together, that jet lag thing comes in, right? Yeah. But when we were in Australia, you know, I told, uh, you know, we saw, you know, Gavin hosted us and we got to see out in the ATSC, you know, footprint there. but. You know, we do Talisman Sabre coming up this summer. It, you know, there's capability forward in Australia. If there's a vehicle that gets damaged or needs repair, you know, this summer, I, my charge is to us is to make sure we assess and if we can repair that vehicle forward. It does not leave the continent. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, if, and really, and, uh, if we can, you know, get to the, like, uh, you know, Dr. Miller said I was supporting the enemy, but if I could, uh, <laughs> if I could distribute a file to Australia, a teammate, and they could advance manufacture it, or another country can manufacture it down the road, and they could put it on a U.S. vehicle or their vehicle, and, and uh, that is, that's winning. And if that gets the legal counsels of the world, shout out, Wendy, or if you're watching, you know, uh, nervous, good, I don't care. We're doing it, because uh, that's what we're going to exactly do when we need to win, and that's where we're going, sir. That's, yeah, that gets great. me fired up thinking about it. Cool. But that's, that's what we're doing. <laughs> awesome, thanks. Uh, on, the, on the back of that, uh, General Reagan, if it could, over to you. You know, you, you talked about uh, your discussions with our Ukrainian partners and, you know, if they could go back in time, what would be those top three investments that you would, uh, you would do now to set conditions so that you were more successful? You know, as you look at the lessons learned and, and the things you covered in your remarks and you look at your theater of operation and how it's distributed and pushing, you know, with that same hindsight, what would you look at as your top three things that you'd really like to take? or need, or if you could do it all over again in set conditions that you don't already have, or maybe something that you have that you need to be reconfigured in a different location. Could you give us a perspective on that, please? Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things that I'm reflecting back on. You know, one of our, my biggest concerns is after the drawdown in Europe in the 90s, they kind of consolidated things. You know, whether that's munitions, they consolidated maintenance activities, and as we're finding out in the modern battlefield is that consolidation creates points of vulnerability. And so those things keep me up day, day every night, you know, just thinking, are, are we doing the right things to make sure that we have distribution across the theater, that we have maintenance activities in several places would be number one. Number two, I would get dispersion in our ammunition and then also other commodities, which we're finding out is critically important, specifically in uh, in a ground type theater like UCOM, it's the ability to distribute you know, commodities of supply, not only to the Army, but to the joint force. And be honest with you, um, from a joint force perspective, my biggest customer is not the United States Army, it's the United States Air Force. And just doing bulk fuel distribution, I think we're out of place. I think a lot of, you know, number two, the, a lot of the things in Europe are, are probably one terrain feature away because we've expanded so rapidly, which is a good thing from a NATO perspective. We've expanded all the way into the eastern flank up into Estonia. We're expanding right now into the high north. We've got two more great um, coalition partners in, the, in Sweden and Finland, but that just opens up more um, opportunity for us to be able to expand. The, the third thing that I, I think and we're already moving down that way, I would have a closer collaboration with the organic industrial base and with our LCMCs. I think it's about you know, connecting that digital thread, just like General Laylor said, if, if you don't have to distribute something over time and space to overcome that part of the physics problem, why would you do it, right? If I can send a digital link and I hit print and I can print it as far forward as possible, I think that's a win. If I can print it in the Indo-Pacific at the same time that I can print it in, in Yukon, that's another win, right? And so I would, I would have a, a much closer collaboration and we're moving in that direction sure. thanks to the leadership of um, 
you know, General Layler and his team, but I would even foster that even further in the future. Yeah, and I think those, like to that point, like, you know, we think about APS and some of our systems there, and, you know, what we did, you know, we're all invested in making sure you, that the theater commander has options and repairing his, you know, forward Bradleys right now. That is a, that is a teamwork event going on where you, you literally got take on repairs forward, but they're, you know, they're part of the ASC framework to take care of the, the vehicles. That's a team event, but, you know, also, uh, he didn't need to ask either. We, we sent them and we launched them because we were invested in it and, uh, you know, no one should care more than us tonight. So making sure that those, those vehicles are repaired and, uh, you know, and then also, you know, I also, you know, if there's one thing I would ask for units out there is, hey, care about maintenance just as much as I do. Uh, meet me in the middle because, uh, you know, that stuff we're repairing, it's yours. And most of the time we're repairing it because you, you didn't give it back to it. You didn't bring it home in the right condition. So, you know, everybody's got a little piece of this uh, to the puzzle. And then you got to think about being forward, like you said, Ron, because, you know, when I think back, I think back, I'm looking at that great AMLC crew here. I think back about, four, you know, four years ago in the throes of the pandemic. And you got to think about your model because our model then was every time we we're going to deploy some APS, we're going to send a team forward to do it. You're not going to have that kind of time. And you're also not going to have... And then the pandemic hit, we couldn't even put people on the aircraft, even though I did anyway. That's a whole other story. But it was because it got it, we had to get where we needed to get it forward and we had to distribute. And I think we, you know, we distributed more medical equipment in those months than we had done in 30 years. And, uh, but it was about leveraging the entire team to do it. CECOM helped me do it. Uh, the AFSB in, Cut in Cutter was out loading those hospitals and putting them on ships out to Ronnie Anderson, where I, can't, I don't know if he left, but... The point was we found ways and you've got to leverage the whole team to do it. And that's what you're talking about. Yeah. And that's the connectedness of this whole thing. And, if it, and, it, and I'm sorry if the process wasn't that wasn't the process that it used to be. It, that's the process it is tonight. And so we got we to execute. So that's, you know, those are just some thoughts on and, that. And the day we can get to where we can print, digitally print a wiring harness, I'm going to drop the mic and walk off the yeah. stage. <laughs> We're working on it. We're going to start with some, we're, you know, every, uh, others are thinking about UAV parts. Where, you know, we're, we got all sorts of things going. We got a jointless hull printer at, uh, that you've seen at, at yeah, Rock yeah. Island. If I could figure out how to, once we get that Millennium Falcon working, as I always call that thing, because you got to bang on that thing with a wrench like a Wookiee to get that thing going and proof it out. But once we do, hulls, um, fuselages, yes, let, let, it, let it rip. So, uh Anyway, we got Cape Billy. We got to we got to untap our potential here yeah. too. Yeah, let me let me let me riff on that for a second because I, I agree with all, but it also takes some some change in how we think about this. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay, like like the drone things. I'm I'm hard up on the drone thing. Um, there's actually NDA language 21 and 23 that prevent us from buying drones with Chinese parts, right? That's the problem, or that's the condition. It's not a problem. Um, so my question to industry has always been like, who can produce a $1,500 drone of reasonable certainty that I don't care and I don't have to flipple if I lose it or break it or ram it into the enemy? Um, and we always talk about, hey, I want to print parts forward. I do, sure, but I also just want a box of spares that don't cost me $10,000 each that I can put into the side. Because right now I got 2nd Brigade 101st and their brigade main has like four Starling terminals and if one breaks, they just pull up the next one. Like that's a change in thought process because we're gonna end up having a, a disparity between like really high end capabilities that we definitely wanna be able to print wire harnesses forward. We definitely wanna be able to just be able to repair forward. And then we're gonna have a bunch of low end capabilities and that's okay. Like that middle ground, it's okay to seed a lot of that middle ground to, hey, it's either gonna be really exquisite and really, really great war winning capabilities or really cheap war winning capabilities. So that like when we start thinking about it, it's gonna take some culture change too. That's good. Yes, sir. And my favorite transforming contact is getting you promoted on the slide here. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that, sir. That's all right. So this question will tie in, <laughs> tie in well to it and really directed it at Dr. Miller and, and probably to General Layler to add some additional comments. And this is really about, you know, as we think of some of that new kit that we want to get on the battlefield uh, with our industry partners, do, do you think... Are there efforts going on in the acquisition world, in the technology world, to get the message across to these providers of this new tech that we need to start thinking about designing the systems to be more easily repaired forward? You talked about build cheap things that we can throw away, which is a, that is a maintenance concept. We replace it. Uh, and how is that feedback on these requirements 
has the government set up anything from industry to provide some of that feedback to, to look at, you know, not just the policies and, and latency and, and delays and bureaucracy and acquisition, but more what do we really physically need to change uh, to be able to get those platforms? And I know that's a lot, yeah. but your thoughts and then General Laylor, as you look at it, thinking about yeah. being a person that does OIB fix, I'm sure General Reagan, you'll have some from the organic capability. Okay. Um, requirements process is broken. Um, we're going to change it. Not we have to change it, we're going to change it. So what the chief has implemented as the chair of the AROC is, General Rennie brought forth uh, this thing called the characterization of need. It was two pages. And it said, hey, our network needs to do sort of these things. One, work. Two, connect systems. Three, allow for a common operating picture. That's about the level of specificity we actually need in our requirements. Not much more. Because the way that it works today is someone drafts a requirement, it takes a year and a half, goes through another year and a half of the process. All the people that read it on the backside were not the people who like we're thinking about it as it was being written. It takes another year of deliberation in the Pentagon before somebody does anything with it. it. Takes another year before we get an acquisition strategy. So now you're probably two PCS cycles removed from who actually read it, wrote the requirement, or needed the thing. And then we buy it, and five years later you get something. So you're ten years removed from whoever needed it. Um, and everybody seems to be like, that's awesome, and it's not. So we're we're changing that process. Um, the secretary has been super super vocal. Uh, and if you listen, go back and listen to her speech on Monday, she asked a couple questions. For all of the capabilities that we're buying, acquiring, adopting, adapting, or fielding, does it make us more lethal, yes or no? If no, we're stopping it. Does it make sense for the future fight, yes or no? Does it make sense? That last one, that's a powerful question for Secretary of the Army to be asking. And then the chief is, is following up and going, hey, we're winning capabilities only. So as we think about this, that's how we're going to change it. Now, what hurts us a lot is um, the thought process that we can design a strategy to get the things we want without involving our customer. And by customer, I mean soldiers. So we're changing that too, which means that everything that we buy or build or adopt or adapt or acquire has to be based on feedback from our soldiers. And I know it's easy to say, and, and, and the depots, and it's a whole different animal, and I know that. And, and I got my first trip with General George when he was the vice, we went to Iowa, and that was eye-opening. That was just hard-working Americans doing hard work. So I, I, I fully recognize that I'm being very reductionist for, this, for that part of the enterprise, but as we think about what goes forward and what we have to repair and what we think about spares, we're, we're going to change that. Um, problems. Um, our contracting officials, like Danielle Moyer, if you, if you listen to TAC, she's amazing. Amazing. So she's helping change culture there. Our PMs are changing. They're thinking about, hey, how do I get this out sooner? How do I let soldiers touch it and provide feedback? So that is changing. CRs crush us every year. I, I cannot remember other than like one year that I've been in federal service where we haven't had a CR at the start of the fiscal year. It crushes us. It's not good. Um, and then thinking about hey, what should we repair again versus what we should like just buy low-cost spares for or low-cost replacements for. Because if you come back and you want to get your next, your next load, I would hope that none of you get, when you come back from a deployment or come back to a unit, that you get the same thing you got one or two or three years prior because technology does not wait one or two or three years. Great. I think my only thoughts on that, I mean, yeah, your yeah. interface with your PEOs and oh, thinking acquisition. Yeah, 100%, sir. I think the, uh, you know, one thing that we talk about with the PEOs all the time as partners is, um, you know, because we're, we're right now, obviously, we're in the throes of the modernization, you know, the largest modernization we've had here in terms of equipment in, in you know, 40 years. And, you know, the, uh, the big, you know, the, we always sit and complain about, you know, um, you know, which we should, because you're right, sir, the requirements process is broken. But, but the one thing we do good as an army, one, one of the many things we do well as an army is the big M comes running at us. We're good at the big M. The material will come. The rest of the integration of everything else, everything that goes around the dot mill PFP, we're a little slower on, and it creates a lot of problems at Echelon, you know, putting on my, uh, you know, putting on my, my, my not-too-distant, you know, past uh, ordinance chief hat. And so what I talk to the PEOs all the time and I would continue to charge them with is, hey, think about simplicity of system here so we can swap things out or we can do uh, maintenance on the move. The systems we have are, you know, the maintainers are constantly in a zone defense. They're not man-to-man -man on any equipment. There's no one-for-one. -one. And 
you know, and so that's why we got Lars out there coaching, teaching, um, mentoring anyway. And so if anybody thinks that LAR program doesn't need to be, you know, sustained or how important it is, let me tell you, it's more important than ever because those soldiers and those operators at unit levels are literally, you know, uh, you know, at their ties with their particular law or whatever their specialty is because they're coaching them through it. But what I would say that commonality is important, right? Like the ISV, we're kind of on the right track, right? It's a Chevy Colorado engine. If we can't maintain that, we got problems. Okay, but, but we don't need to hang anything more on it. Just work with the payloads and keep it simple. You know, we, when, you, when the chief came up to Detroit Arsenal and you were there, sir, you know, he was... He was saying, no more variance on this thing. Keep it simple, right? Right? Remember that conversation? Because, because again, you more make it complicated or the more variance you make it, uh, the, the more challenging it becomes. So that's, that's one thing there. Um, and then the other thing I would just add, you know, only amplify what you're saying, sir, is uh, iterative development. And that goes for software, too. You know, putting, you know, thinking about as being the, uh, the EBS convergence director there for three years, which is like the longest job I ever had, I always say. But, but the... Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, working with Jennifer Swanson and the team there as we did, it, you know, thinking about that. As that's now coming out now, you got an acquisition decision. Hey, everybody get on board culturally and get ready. Your commodity's going in there, and we need to iteratively turn and put out development there. And, and you know, we get all the questions because, like you said, p people who started their requirements later, now they're gone. They're on five different jobs, and we're like, and we're going back to the start. Like, well, what do we need to roll out first? We need ammo. That's why. We've had an ammo broken we had a broken ammo management system from the strategic to the tactical end since 1775, and that's what we need to fix tonight, okay? Because it doesn't, you can't see the commodity from the, uh, from the, from the joint manufacturing level to the tactical edge. That's what it's going to help start to fix. So instead of replowing the world and having to restart again, I'm here to tell you, ammo. And the reason why we did it was um, for those kind of reasons, iterative development. Oh, by the way, then we need to take down the other 16 systems bankroll that money and keep going and medical your stuff's going in that commodity okay just want to make sure you all understand it's going in there for the reason because we got to see the commodity and it's changes like that iterative development commonality of systems sir those i think are very very important to how we operate going forward i appreciate that so i'm going to change the wording just a tad bit here this is a, a dr miller i think you'll have some input general layler you general reagan you probably will have a thought on it too this is about the discussion that's gone on during the brief is the theme of the ability to do telemaintenance, remote maintenance, dis maintenance at distance. And, and the question is really now, as we talk about that, you know, is there any experimenting? I'll add in a few words, you know, what are the enabling activities going on right now to take a look at the digital backbones and networks that we'll have to use, not in a commercial setting, but really as we move it farther forward to the tactical edge, where those become you know, more and more constrained, and, and the systems that are required to actually execute a, 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 a system of network maintenance, you know, with the right authorities and capabilities as you go forward. So is, is there any thought going on along that area right now from a technology perspective, Dr. Miller? And then, you know, if you're doing anything, right. Michael, with the sure. team, to, to think through that, is there anything there? Yeah, and, and I'll let them talk about specific things that we're doing what i would offer is is logistics is part of battle command so we got to stop treating it like it's not which means it is part of the commander's network it is part of the commander's portfolio it is commander's business so everything that we're working on is is telemaintenance shouldn't have its own network it is the commander's network so as we're thinking about how we 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 miniaturize and modernize the the tactical and i'm thinking purely conventional here. Um, as we think about how we modernize that, all of that is, is, all of this is part of the conversation. So as a, if a commander needs telemaintenance support on the network, the network should be robust enough and reliable enough to enable that. That's, and, and, and I've seen some great examples in, in Europe um, that I won't spoil, but that is, that is how we're changing the thinking. It is not a separate system or architecture or thought process. Thanks. Yeah, sir. We're uh, thanks, sir. I think you know to that point. What we're doing, we get, we're we're very invested in the initiative because um, it goes back to what I was talking about with the logistics assistance reps and extending our capability to the tactical edge. Is because if we fight tonight, um, again, your your lars are going to be busy, but they're going to be busy from a, from the you know over geography or you know, the tyranny of distance. And so making sure we can connect and coach. Um, we're on, we got para, we got a couple different efforts going. The first one is. 
uh, working to, to use our organic equipment now that we already own and put that in play. We have a maintenance support device that really we've never untapped the potential for. Our, my, you know, one of my goals and missions in life is to get that on the network, use that device and let our LARs connect with the maintainers at, at, the, at the point of attack so they can do some maintenance. Again, telemaintenance doesn't have to be exquisite. I mean, we do want it to be able to, uh, you know, take some pictures, uh, transmit, do some chat. We want to be able to tell a straight, like I always say, like, uh, you know, like an NFL analyst, but, um, and we want language translation, TMs, and different things, but it's just got to work under bandwidth, right? You know, the LARs have been doing telemaintenance since the LAR program was, they invented telemaintenance. It's just now we got to make sure we can bridge the gap in, in that fight. So that's one lane. The other one is that our industry partners have some really good products out there that I'd like to see us, um, I'd like to see us kind of have an acquisition bake off, so to speak, and let them compete in the CTCs and see what works. Uh, and, and let us try it because, uh, you know, or, or demonstrate it for us. So we'll we're, we're work towards something like that with AMC. That's where my mind is with it because we're, we're just been, you know, everybody's got, I've seen all the demos, you know, General Mohan and I have seen all the demos. Look, good, we'll have a bake off and we'll have a nice day. And, and the point is though, we need to pick a winner and we need to move forward and get moving on this because we're gonna need it real soon. And uh, that's, that's, and that's, you know, kind of my thought with it. And, and uh, you know, and again, it's a great, that's a great example into yourself, Dr. Miller, like you're saying is, all our, 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 our the way we do funding and different things and the bureaucracy comes in, well, hey, this funding was for Ukraine, you can't test it at a CTC. Hey, uh, you, know, uh, you know what, let's move on with that. Like these are units that are training to go on Eastern Europe to protect the Ukrainian front. So let's kind of hurdle through it, let's test, this. let's use the money, let's test the, the systems. We're, that's what, these are some things where we're headed, sir. So or, one, with organic and two, using commercial, because I think we need to be able to do both. General Reagan, as you, as you move forward to that maintenance collection point that you own and some of the lessons I'm sure you've seen with what was going on in Ukraine. Yes, so with the thoughts. remote maintenance um, distribution site in Ukraine, Ukraine, that's forward in Poland, I, I think there's opportunity for us to work, as General Laylor said, and really push the envelope of what, what is possible. They're doing great work, and we've done over 9,000 remote remote jobs yep. and it's enabling them to keep the momentum inside of ukraine time now but i i think that technology we're at the nascent edge of it and we need to push the envelope of what's possible so all of our industry partners we're looking to you to you know really leapfrog us into the 21st century right uh, the the ability to connect over dis time and distance hugely important if you think about it, not just in the context of Europe, but in the Indo-Pacific, I believe it's very important. Um, but the technologies, um, I think we're, we've got some work to do. Awesome. And unfortunately, there's lots of questions. Oh, we got one. Okay, we'll squeeze one more in. I might cut you off because you only got three minutes. <laughs> yes, hello. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. My name is Cameron Hamilton. I was a former operator in the SEAL teams. Uh, thank you all for your time and your service and your feedback here. I had a question regarding the organic industrial base. There's been a lot of emphasis on how do we produce more? How do we yield more here in the United States? We haven't tested a lot of our large scale weapon systems in quite a while. So my question to you all is, is there an effort within the DOD to actually recruit and bring in industry experts to actually reproduce and assemble American needs on a mass basis in the event that we faced industrialized nation warfare, the likes of which we saw in World War II. An example of that, I would say, I spoke with Senator Tim Kaine, we're gonna be entering in a mentorship program with the Australians to show them how to build components for submarines and to advance their weaponry. My question here is, Ford built B-24 bombers back during World War II. We recruited active members of industry and showed them the assemblage of how to reproduce on a mass scale. Is there an effort within the DOD now to potentially go out and find that organic industrial base and actively solicit their involvement so that we can basically build on a system to strategize on what it would take to do that within six months, 12 months, 24 months in the event that the United States was engaged in a conflict very similar to what we're seeing with Ukraine and Russia? Sorry for the lengthy That's question. Great. Okay, I would say, so, so uh, yes, no, here's, here's what I, so, so, so it's a great question. So I think, in short, I would say, does DO, is DOD working through that? I, 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 I understand that they are, at OSD levels, they have those conversation, Office of Secretary of Defense, and thinking through some, 
you know, having worked up there, I know those conversations go on. I could tell you closer to home inside our organic industrial base, uh, it's about partnerships. It's also about bringing the right talent in, right? So I'm, I'm uh, you know, we're located right in the heart of uh, downtown Detroit. We got relationships with Ford and GM and, and those partners. Now, I think we can improve on them, that's for sure. But, you know, I, honestly, I try to bring it, we try to bring in talent from them all the time. I'm trying to, uh, you know, bring them on board and, and, and you poach them straight up, I'm just trying to bring them in. And a lot of them have. I, I will tell you, we had a job fair in March uh, in, in uh, we had 200 people running around that arsenal up there, and, and uh, a lot of them were on there, like took a day off and were in there, and ten they were like, don't tell my boss, but I'm in here looking for a job, because <laughs> they want to come work for us. So the point is, that's going on, and I would also say, too, that, uh, you know, it's also, uh, I think there's some work to be done there at scale where we talk about, you know, um, we, we do have these conversations with our, with our partners and making sure that we can share some data, and, and if we have to expand and, and sources, we do that. but. Um, there's room to grow, but it is going on, and so I, I, hopefully that answers part of the question for you. And I know there's probably dozens more, but unfortunately I also have to monitor the time. Uh, thank AUSA for allowing us to come together as a team and group and discuss these critical topics. Gerald Mohan, thanks for your comments. Panel members, thanks for your insights on what's really going on and some future thoughts. And audience, thanks for some great questions. Uh, that concludes the panel. Thanks, sir. All right.